Uh, yeah, here it'll do, I suppose. Right. Let's hope that the. Right. Okay. Guten Abend. <laughs> do not be fooled by the name. Despite having a German name, despite having done three years of German at school, Ein Bier Bitte is about as good as it gets. So what I'm going to talk about this evening is Java SE8, but specifically about Lambda expressions and the Streams API, because these are two of the biggest changes that we've included in Java, really since Java SE5 came out, which was, scarily enough, nearly 10 years ago. And so this is a significant change to the language, and it's a significant change in terms of the APIs. Is this going to work? No. I was going to say, I'm going to have to, yeah, I'll have to, okay. So this is the usual Oracle slide, which says, you know, that we're not saying that we will deliver anything at a specific time. I think we're fairly safe to move past that because we actually have got the GA of Java SE8. So um, the launch officially will happen tomorrow, but we don't need to worry about that. So let's move on from that. Now, the reason for including Lambda expressions into Java is because if you think about the kinds of computers that you use today, they're all pretty much multi-core or multi-processor machines. That means that when we write code, we can actually do things in parallel. We can be more efficient in terms of our code by using parallel execution. Now, Java has, right from the very beginning, had the concept of multiple threads of execution. So right from Java 1.0, we had the thread class We've had the ability to do things like sleep, wait, notify, and interrupt. So that's all good. So we can actually have multiple threads and execute them in parallel. But the problem is that if you try and apply that to writing application code, it's very difficult to write reliable code just using those four primitives and synchronized blocks and volatiles and those types of things. So in Java SE5, we introduced the concurrency utilities. That gave us a whole lot more APIs. It gave us the ability to do things like semaphores, things like mutexes, things like read-write locks, which are all things that people understand when they've done multi-threaded parallel processing code. Java SE6, we introduced the idea of a couple more APIs, things like phasers and different ways of, co of coordinating threads and so on. And then in Java SE7, we introduced the fork join framework, which was the idea of taking a, a single task decomposing it into a number of subtasks, having that happen recursively until you got to the point where the task was small enough to have it execute in a single thread. So that saved a lot of work for you as developers because you didn't have to worry about the thread pool, you didn't have to worry about how the queues were organized and how we did things like thread stealing. But what we wanted to do is go further. How could we make it simpler for you as developers to write really good parallel code and make it simple to write parallel code. And that's what we're doing in Java SE8. So this is the introduction of the Lambda expression. So we can, yeah. And if we can just move on to the next one as well. Right, so this is, this is Lambdas in Java. Why do we need them and what's the, the reality behind this? This is a very simple piece of Java code. It's the kind of thing that we do a lot of, actually, um, Stephen, I'm going to move over here because I think it's probably easier if I stand this side because there's a lot of people over there. This is a very simple piece of Java code. What we're doing here is we're taking a collection and we want to find something in that collection. So what we do is we say we're looking in our collection of students for the student. <laughs> Yeah, you just plugged in the, uh, the thing for the clicker, haven't you? <laughs> ah, excellent, right, a clicker that works, good. Okay, let's see if I can manage this. Right, so as I say, we've got a collection of students. What we want is to find what was the highest score that any student scored in a particular year. So to do that, we can write this code. This is perfectly valid, works Java code. So I say, OK, I've got my collection of students. I need to, a variable to record what my highest score was. And then I use a loop. I iterate over the collection. And I test to see if the graduation year was 2011. If it was, 
I compare the score of that student against my current highest score. If it was higher, then I record that in my variable, and I do that until the end of the collection. It works, fine, no problem, but it has some drawbacks. Problem with this is that we are controlling the iteration. So we have the for loop in our code. And that means that we're making it inherently serial. We can't simplify this in terms of decomposing it into parallel threads in a simple way. The other problem is that we're not thread safe. Because we've got a mutable variable, higher score, which we're changing, if we wanted to break it up into multiple threads, chain the method calls together to have the same effect. So we take our collection of students, and this time we say that the highest score is going to be to take that student collection and filter it. So we filter it based on some behavior that we want. And the behavior is defined by the predicate. In this case, it's an anonymous inner class. We define what the anonymous inner class does in its method, and we say that we compare the graduation year to 2011, return true if it is, false if it isn't. The results of that filter is a subset of our collection. And we pass that to a map method. That then takes a class, an anonymous in a class of type mapper, which extracts some information from that set. So this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna extract the scores from those students. So what we pass to the max is a set of scores for all the students who graduated in the year 2011. And then we can pass that to this max method and we can identify from that which method, or which student got the highest score or what the highest score was. So this is much better because it means that now we don't have the iteration in our code. We're separating that out, we're putting that into the underlying library code. And the important thing about that is that we're now not making it inherently serial. So we could make it serial or we could make it parallel because how filter works, how map works, how max works, those can be handled by library code. And if we want to have our filter happen in parallel, we can do that. If we want to have our map happen in parallel, we can do that by applying the right kind of code. So we can also do things in a lazy manner. If we wanted to, rather than having all of the students filtered before we pass any of the results on to the map method, we could do it so that as we get the students who graduated in 2011, we pass them on to the map method and we make them available. So that way, if we were looking for, say, the first student who scored more than 80 in a particular year, and we've got a million students in our collection, rather than having to go through all one million students to find those who graduated in 2011, before we start looking for those who've got more than 80, we might find that we only need to process three rows of data before we find a result. So that way, by doing it as a sequence of operations and lazy evaluation, we can really improve the efficiency of how we do these things. Now, the problem with this is that the code is just plain ugly because we're using these anonymous inner classes, which Let's face it, they were a bit of a kludge when we added them way back in the, the, the mists of time for Java. And if you look at the, the code here, what I've done is I've actually highlighted some of it in red and the rest of it's in blue. The red code is what we actually are interested in. It's the key parts of the code. The rest of it is mostly just filler. It's like boilerplate code that we have to put in there in order to use an anonymous in a class. So we need some way of changing this so we can use the same approach, so we can make our code parallel if we want to, but not having to go through all this work of including all this extra code. So this is what a Lambda expression does. A Lambda expression allows us to simplify that. 
So in this case, what we're saying is it's, it's effectively a replacement for the use of an anonymous inner class, and to be a little bit more explicit, where you have a single abstract method type. I'll come back to that in a moment. But if we rewrite that using lambda expressions, what we end up with is this. So we're still doing filter, map, and max. But now, rather than having the anonymous inner class, we have a lambda expression. And you can think of a lambda expression like a method. But it's, it's a little bit different to a method. And there's a number of reasons for that. So you can think of it like a method in that the left-hand side of the arrow is the parameters that you're passing to that method. The right-hand side of the arrow is the body of the method. So it's doing the same thing. We're passing a student S as a parameter, and we're processing it by saying, compare the graduation year to 2011. Now, we don't have an explicit return type or return statement in this code. So the compiler will figure that out for us. We're simply saying there is a comparison to 2011, so the compiler will infer that the return type is a Boolean. So that's all good. Similarly, with the map, we're simply saying that the parameter that we pass to this method is a student, and that the body of the method is to return the score of that student. So it does exactly the same thing, but it's much, much easier to see what's going on. So we end up with a lot more readable code, because now we can suddenly see, oh, much clearer on what we're doing. It's more abstract in terms of the code that we're using, and so the way that we're defining things is, is more abstract in terms of the concept. Less error prone because there's less opportunity for typing things in the wrong way. Still no reliance on mutable state, so we can decompose it more easily into a parallel set of threads if we want to, and therefore it's easier to make parallel. Now, if we look at some of the, the details associated with lambda expressions, basically a lambda expression represents an anonymous function. So I said it was like a method, but it's not a method. So a method has to be associated with a specific class. That's the way it works in Java. With lambda expressions, they are anonymous. There is no class associated with them. And that will have some impact in terms of the way that we use them and some things we need to remember about them. So in terms of its structure, it's like a method. So it has a set of typed arguments. It has a body. It has a return type. It can even throw exceptions if you want to. So structure is the same as a method, but it is anonymous, and we call it a function because it's not associated with a class. The really important thing about this is that what we're now adding to Java is a simple way of parameterizing behavior as well as values. Because using a lambda expression, you can now pass the way that you want something to happen rather than just a value that you want to process with your method. So what we've got here, in terms of the, the structure of our code now, is we're saying that we've got our collection of students, and we want to filter that, map it, and then perform a max operation. And that's really saying what we want to do. So the what is the filter, the map, and actually you can say max is a reduce. It's just a particular form of that. The lambda expressions say how we want to do that. So that's the big thing, is the separation of the what from the how. Parameterized behavior, we can pass a lambda expression as a way of saying how we want something to actually happen. Now, if we look at um, some of the more, uh, more details about lambda expressions, we use single abstract method types a lot in Java. So things like runnable has a single method run. Things like callable has a single method call, action listener has a single method action performed. So these are interfaces that have a single method associated with them. You can use them with an anonymous in a class, that's fine. What we're saying here is that this is a functional interface. Any interface which has a single abstract method in it is a functional interface in terms of Java from Java SE 8. Now, one of the things that is a little bit confusing about this is the fact that a functional interface must have only one abstract method. But that doesn't mean that it actually only has to have one method. There's two reasons why that can change, but I'll, I'll come back to that as we talk about some of the other features of Java SE 8. 
So the type of a lambda expression, because when you're passing a parameter to another method, it must have a type associated with it, will always be a functional interface. There will be some interface that's represented by that lambda expression, and that's what the type will be. Now, in terms of variable capture, if you look at anonymous inner classes, you can reference variables from the surrounding scope of that anonymous inner class. But there is a restriction on that, which is that any variable you access from the surrounding scope must be final. So you can't modify the value of that variable within your anonymous inner class. With lambda expressions, we've kind of relaxed that rule a little bit. So now, you don't actually have to mark the variable as being final, but it has to behave as if it was marked as final. So we have the idea of effectively final variables. Now, in this example here, what I've done is I've created a method which passes a parameter called before of type long. And then I've got a lambda expression where I want to use that. So this is using the, the variable in the surrounding scope. Even though before has not been marked as final, it behaves as if it was final because it's only set once, I'm not modifying it, and that way I can use it within the body of the lambda expression quite happily. And this is one of the reasons that we call these, this particular syntax lambda expressions. We don't call them closures. If you've used other programming languages that have closures, this is one of the significant differences. Closures would allow you to access non-final variables outside of the scope of the lambda, or well, the, the expression. So these are not full closures, they are lambda expressions. Another thing with lexical scoping is that in an anonymous in a class, that is a class. Call it an anonymous in a class, it is a class. So the compiler will generate this class for you. So any method that you define within that is obviously associated with a class, which therefore has an object associated with it in the context of the use of that anonymous in a class. A lambda expression is an anonymous function, and that's a subtle difference because there is no class associated with it. That means that in an anonymous in a class, if you refer to this, this variable, it will refer to the object of that anonymous in a class. In the case of a lambda expression, there is no class, there is no object, therefore this will refer to the object of the surrounding scope. So that is a slight difference between the use of anonymous, anonymous in a class and a lambda expression. So in this case, where I reference this dot before, again, it's referring to the before in the surrounding scope because this is the object that that is in. Type inference. What we can do here is we can actually use the fact that we know things about things like collections. So collections, we have generics introduced back in Java SE5. If I take this example here, I've got a, a method here, sort, which takes a list and a comparator. Now we've used the generics and the type parameters to define the types that we're using. So the list will be of type T, and the comparator will be of um, a wild card, which is a superclass of type T. So we know that there's a relationship between the type of the comparator and the type of the list. And that means that if I define a list of type string that I want to use, and then I do a sort on that, I can pass in LS as my list, which I know is of type string, and then I can define a comparator which takes two arguments, string x and string y, and then the body of the lambda expression will be to return the difference in the length. So that's how I'm going to compare them. But the compiler already knows that ls is a list of type string. So in this case, I don't explicitly have to state that x and y are string. So I can leave that out. That's another shortcut that we can use in lambda expressions. The important thing about this is that this does not introduce any form of dynamic typing into Java. This is still very much static typing because the compiler knows the type of the collection and therefore you can't use you know, different types in terms of the lambda expression. It must be a lambda expression where X and Y are both of type string. So this is what we say is more typing 
with less typing, which is why you can use English as a, a good way of uh, writing jokes, because typing in terms of the, the types that we use for the variables and typing on the keyboard. Method references. This is another shortcut that we've introduced to simplify a number of Lambda expressions. If you have a Lambda expression where all you're doing is calling a method on a variable or on a class, which is the parameter, then you can shorten that so that it becomes the name of the class, colon, colon, and the name of the method. And so that will do the same thing as that Lambda expression where you've got file f arrow f dot can read. You can shorten that to file colon, colon, can read. And on the whole, that's a really good thing. Sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. There's, there's an example where if you use system.out colon colon print line, you look at that and you go, it's printing something, but I don't actually know what it's printing. So sometimes it can be a little bit deceptive in terms of understanding what's going on. You can also do the same with a constructor. A constructor is a method, so we can use a reference to that rather than actually having to call it explicitly. So the same idea as before. If I want to, I can say, okay, I've got a factory here of list of type string, and I'm going to assign that to be a Lambda expression, which is a constructor reference by saying array list of type string colon colon new. And that will instantiate a new instance of an array list of type string and is equivalent to the same Lambda expression. One thing that's worth noting here is that if you have no arguments for your Lambda expression, don't need any arguments, then you use an empty set of brackets to indicate that is the case. So you have to put brackets there to indicate that there are no uh, parameters. So we talked about Lambda expressions. Let's talk about libraries and how we can evolve them and how we can use this power, this idea of having behavior passed as parameters to enhance the libraries that we've got. What we want to be able to do is to provide ways of dealing with aggregate operations. And we do this a lot in Java. You know, we've seen where we do things like filtering, where we do things like sorting, where we do things like searching. So you know, I want to find blue blocks or whatever, so I'm using filter, map, reduce. Very typical type of approach to doing sort of this sort of thing. The problem is that as we have it today, or I should say last week, um, Java, in terms of the collections API, didn't have a map, a filter, or a reduce method. So how can we extend things like the collections APIs to add new methods? Because the collections API is based very heavily on interfaces. So if we want to extend an interface and add more methods to it, we can do that. You know, we just add more methods into it, fine. But it breaks backwards compatibility. Any class which use that interface where it doesn't have filter, map, or reduce in it, when you want to compile against that or link against it, you're going to find that it can't be resolved in terms of those methods. So you get a break in backwards compatibility. So what we need to do is find some way that we can extend existing interfaces without breaking backwards compatibility. And that's basically what we've done. We've added extension methods default methods, defender methods, to Java SE 8. And what this means now is that in, a, in, in, an, in an interface, you can now define a method which has a default implementation. That way, when you compile against a class which uses that interface <coughs> and doesn't have an implementation of that particular interface, the compiler will say, OK, in that case, I'll use the default version. So for stream, it'll use stream support dot stream splitterator. So this is good because now we have the situation where we can add methods to an existing interface without breaking backwards compatibility. For the observant amongst you, you will of course go, oh, hang on, stop just a moment. We're adding behavior to an interface. Doesn't that mean that we're adding multiple inheritance to Java? Well, the answer is yes and no. Because if you think about it, Java already has multiple inheritance of types. Interfaces, by their very nature, are a way of having multiple types associated with a specific class. Good old polymorphism 
If you look at a particular object, if it has multiple interfaces, you can use that, view that object in different ways based on different interfaces. So we've always had multiple inheritance of types. What we're now doing is adding multiple inheritance of behavior. You can include behavior in, a, a interface, in an interface, but we're not adding multiple inheritance of state. And that's really where a lot of the problems come in terms of uh, if you look at languages like C++ that do proper multiple inheritance. There are some, some issues that you have to be aware of. So if you have a class which implements uh, interface A and interface B, if both those interfaces have methods in them which have the same signature and have a default associated with them, and the class doesn't implement that, what does the compiler do? How does the compiler decide whether to use the default version from A or the default version from B? And the answer is, if it can't resolve them by any means, it will report it as a compiler error. And therefore, you, as a developer, have to figure out how to resolve that problem manually. But so long as it can differentiate between the signatures of the methods, then it will use the appropriate default method. In terms of functional interfaces, I mentioned that Lambda expressions can be used for functional interfaces. So wherever you, you can use a Lambda expression is where a functional interface can be used. Functional interface, remember, is one that has a single abstract method associated with it. So I mentioned that you can have more than one method in an interface, and only one of them is abstract. So if you look at something like the predicate interface, you'll find it has five methods in it. One is an abstract method. Three have default implementations. And if you have a default implementation, it is not deemed or not termed abstract. And the fifth one is actually a static method. And this is another change in Java SE8, is that you can now put a static method in an interface. So a functional interface is one that has one abstract method. And you can mark that using an annotation. So at functional interface will be used by the compiler and will test to make sure that your interface matches the criteria for a functional interface. And as long as it does, then it will compile quite happily. So let's look at how we can use lambdas and extension methods and streams. Because what we want to do is we want to add this ability to use things like filter, map, reduce, so that we can do this more functional style of programming. And we now know that we can add new methods to an existing interface. We can extend the collections API. We can do all of that. So what we're looking for is you know, being able to find the most profitable company by, or product by region, grouping transactions by currency, all these types of questions that we have to solve. And we know that up until now, we've tended to use external iteration. We have explicit loops. We do it that way. In Java SE8, to solve this and make it so that we're not making our code inherently serial or inherently parallel, we have the stream API, which works with lambdas. Now, what a stream is, is in effect a way of specifying these aggregate computations. Now, the important thing to remember about a stream is it's not a data structure. It actually might look like a data structure at times, but it is not a data structure. Another thing that's important to understand about a stream is it can be infinite. If you are generating, say, random numbers or a feed from you know, a trading system, potentially that could be infinite. So you can have an infinite stream. Of course, some people look at that and they go, well, if I've got an infinite stream and I'm doing you know, processing on it, how do I stop processing that stream? And there's different ways of doing that. But you can end up with a situation where you don't stop processing that stream. But then that's not bad because, well, it is bad, I suppose, but um, the point is I can just as easily write a piece of code in Java, which is infinite. You know, infinite loops very easy to write, while true semicolon. It'll just carry on forever. Same thing can be done with streams. It's not including something new. So the other thing about streams is that by the way we define them, the way we, way we use them, it enables us to apply underneath, using the library code, a number of different options 
optimizations. We can actually make the code run very efficiently by looking at what's happening in terms of the streams. We can fuse together operations, we can do lazy evaluation, we can apply parallelism where it's appropriate. So like I say, a stream is really a pipeline of operations that we want to apply to a set of data. And a stream consists of three things. The first is a source. So where are we gonna get a set of elements from that we want to do something with? Then we have zero or more intermediate operations. And what those do is they take a stream, they do something to it, and they produce another stream. And then when we've finished doing all of our intermediate operations, we end up with the stream as our output, and then we pass that to a terminal operation. Terminal operation will take that information in the stream and generate either a result or some kind of side effect. Now, what I mean by a side effect is something like you may have a place where you decide you want to print out some message or something. So that is a side effect. Even if you're not generating a result, that would be a side effect. But it, it stops what you're doing with the stream. So if we look at the example here, processing some transactions. Now, there is a, a new method on the collections API where you can call and you can get a stream. So that will generate your stream. And what that does is provide us with the source. So from our collection of transactions, we ask for a stream. That's what we get. But remember, it's not a data structure, so it's just a stream that represents the elements coming from that collection. Then we've got a filter where we use a Lambda expression to define how we want to do that filtering. Filter says what, the Lambda expression says how. So that's an intermediate operation. So we filter the stream to reduce it to only the, play, or only the elements which have a buyer from London. So we get a stream on the output, which is smaller, or potentially smaller, could be the same size, as the stream on the input. And then we use a map to int as another intermediate operation to convert the transactions that we've got into, or stream of transactions, into a stream of integers, which is the price associated with that. And then our terminal operation, which is again another reduce in effect, specialized reduce, is to say, sum these values together. So each thing coming through the stream will be added and you will get the result, which is the sum of all of those transactions. Now there are a number of ways that you can actually get a source of a stream. So obviously there's collection.stream, that will give you a stream. And in that case, that's a serial stream. So it's a stream which has one thread associated with it. If you want to make it parallel, you can simply say collection.parallel stream, and that will give you a parallel stream. So you can decompose that into multiple threads and have that processed in parallel. The way that works internally is it uses the fork join framework. So the fork join framework is used internally in the library code to break that into a number of threads. Um, a stream itself, if you've got a, a serial stream, so if you do collection.stream, you could then call um, the parallel method on that stream, and that, that would create a set of parallel streams as well. Um, you, if you've got an array, you can use the arrays.stream method, pass in an array, and that will generate a stream of elements from that array. Or if you want to, you can use the static method on stream and say stream.of. There are some nice little static factories that have been included in different classes. So for example, if you were looking for a range of numbers, integers, then you can say int stream dot range, and you give it the starting point and the end point. So you could say one comma 100, and that will give you the integers from one to 100. Files dot walk, you pass in a path, and then what you get back is a stream, which is the walk through the file system structure, giving you all the different paths to the elements in that file structure. And if you want to, <clears throat> you can actually create your own using the splitterator class or splitterate, yeah, splitterate class uh, method, I should say. No, I think it's a class, actually. It's an interface. Um, anyway, use splitterator, and that, that is a whole other presentation on its own, so I'm not going to talk about splitterator specifically here. Um, now, in terms of stream sources, there's also a number of different things that you get with a stream. So clearly, a stream gives you access to a sequence of elements, you know, the items in your collection, items in your array, 
the files in your file system structure. But you also get some other things. You get the ability to decompose it into parallel operations, as I said, using the fork join framework. And you get characteristics about the stream. So the, the stream will have some characteristics that are used internally. Things like, is that stream ordered? Now, a list has an order associated with it because the elements in that list are in a particular order. So if you're taking a list and generating a stream from it, it will be ordered. It may be distinct. That means that all of the elements in that stream are not going to be equal to each other. It could be sorted. So you could say it does have not just an order to it, but it has a sorted order. So we know that it's in alphabetical order, numerical order, whatever. It could be sized. So we know that the stream has a fixed size, and that can be very useful in terms of how we optimize processing. Subsized is a, is a little bit involved. It's basically, if you do break things up into subcomponents or, or decompose it, then you're saying that the, um, the substreams will also be sized. It doesn't actually have to always be the case. So if you're using something like a, it's a, um, a, a tree structure, sometimes you know the size of the tree structure, but you don't know the size of the individual parts of the tree. So um, that's an example. Non-null means that you will not have any null elements in your stream. Immutable means that you can't change the elements in your stream. And concurrent means that it can be handled concurrently. So different aspects of the, or characteristics of the stream. Terminal operations are basically when the pipeline gets executed. Because the, the way that the, the intermediate operations and the source work is that you're really just constructing what's going to happen. When you call the terminal operation, that's when everything actually happens. And so the underlying library code will fuse together where possible operations. And the idea is that you only have to have then one pass on the data. Other things that we can do in terms of taking advantage of some of the things we know is, for example, if we know that the stream is sized, so we know it has a specific size, and you're using the toArray method as your terminal operation, you want to make an array of it, then we know that we can, can pre-assign an array of the right size because we know how big it is. So it's things like that that enable us to, again, make improvements in efficiency. Um, map and flat map. So map is the idea where you take an input stream and you generate an output stream by applying a function to each element on the input stream. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So you say, OK, you know, input stream is you know, students. Output stream is the score of those students. So you're mapping from a student into a score. A flat map is a one-to-many mapping. Now, I'm going to talk about an example in a moment, which will make that a lot easier to understand. But essentially, what you're saying is that each element in the stream is processed in such a way that the result is a stream of results. So each element becomes a stream on its own. And that way you end up with, in effect, a stream of streams. But quite often you don't want that. What you actually want is one stream on the output. So flat map will take those stream of streams, concatenate them, and give you a single stream as the output. I will, like I say, I'll give you an example in a moment which makes that very clear as to what that really means. Now, the other thing that we introduced in Java SE8, which is closely linked to uh, streams, is the idea of an optional. So this is all about reducing the idea of null pointer exceptions. This is a very typical way that you might do something in Java. So you, you string together, or concatenate together a bunch of method calls. And in this case, what I've been doing is working on some GPS stuff. So I've got GPS data as an object. I call get position on that. And then I call get latitude on the resultant value, call get direction on the resultant value of that, which is fine. Except that if GPS data is null, I'm going to get a null pointer exception because I can't call get position on a null. Similarly, if get position returns a null, I'm going to get a null pointer exception thrown because get latitude can't be called on a null. And same for get direction. So I've got the possibility in several places of throwing a null pointer exception. Different languages provide different solutions to this. There's this bizarrely named Elvis operator, which some languages use, which basically say if you, any of these return a null, then rather than throwing a null pointer exception and trying to continue, you just return a null as the result, which is one way of doing it. 
So what we're going to do, we're not going to do it that way. So we end up doing it in Java at the moment to be safe, is we do it this way. So we end up with like, direction is unknown, if GPS data does not equal null, position P equals GPS data, position, blah, 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 blah. And we end up with a lot of extra code. It's very nice and safe, but it's you know, a lot of extra code. So this is why the, the optional makes life a whole lot easier. Because what an optional down does is it basically says it contains an object or it doesn't. So it's either there or it's not. It's optional. Now, that might sound a little bit sort of glib, but it, it does make a lot of sense. Because you can think of it in some ways as a stream which has zero or one elements in it. If there's zero elements, when you call a method on that, it does nothing. So it doesn't throw a null pointer exception. If there is an element there, it does whatever you want to do. And there's different ways that you can do, use this. So for example, I can create an optional of type GPS data. I'll call it maybe GPS. And to create that, I'll use optional of GPS data. Now, the problem with that is that if GPS data is null, am I doing for time? Good. If GPS data is null, I'm actually going to throw an null pointer exception straight away. So that's probably not a great advance on what we had before. But you can do of nullable. And that way, if GPS data is null, or if it's a, a value, then the optional gets assigned appropriately. So we end up with maybe GPS. And then what we can do is we can say, maybe GPS, if present, do this. So the if present is like the, the idea of saying the stream from maybe GPS is either zero or one elements. If it's present, we will print the position. But if it's not present, we don't do anything. So it's a, a null, a no op. So nothing happens, there's no null pointer exception. We can also have um, an or else. So we can say, let's say I want to make sure that I definitely have a GPS data object. So what I'll do is I'll say, take maybe GPS, and if that has something in it, which is a valid GPS data, return that. Or else, create me a new one using this particular expression here, so new GPS data. And then we can take that one step further and we can say, we can filter. So we say maybe GPS dot filter, where we say, let's look at the last read date on that GPS data. If it was less than two minutes ago, then that's what we want to use. So that means that we get a result out of that. And if it's present, then display the data. So this is a way of chaining together things so that we've got an optional which we can filter based on some predicate, some criteria. And then if that returns a result, then we do something with it. So this is a nice way of avoiding null pointer exceptions. And in fact, there's, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do. You can also use flat map, but unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that right now. Um, collections and streams and iterables. So uh, you, you have the idea of an iterator already. That's a well-known interface in Java. So what we've now done is add a for each method to uh, the iterator interface, iterable interface. And we've also made it part of the stream interface. And that's where things get a little bit com confusing, a little bit complicated, because you can use for each with an iterator. And obviously, that will apply the Lambda expression to each element in the iter iterable interface or object. Um, but you shouldn't use it, really, for streams. If you're using, uh, there are some cases where you would use it. But on the whole, you shouldn't really use it. So you then ask, well, why did we include it? Time? OK, five minutes. Then I'm, I'm going to be finished. <laughs> Honest. Um, so if you use like word list, which is um, collection, that implements iterable. So you can just do a print. That's fine. But if we had something like this, where we've got a list L. And we say, OK, so we've got something we're going to map based on Lambda expression. And then what we want to do is we want to add all of those elements that we generate from that into this list. We could do for each and then say, add that element to the list. But that's not good, because it, we can't make that parallel. Um, it's not thread safe. So the, the better way of doing that is actually to do a collect on uh, and to list. So that's the safe way of doing that. So just to kind of wind up, I've just got a few examples I just want to go through very quickly. So this is example one, where we want to convert all the words in a list to uppercase. So basically, we're taking out a, a word list, which is our um, collection, and we ask it for a stream. So we get our uh, source stream, and then we map it based on just converting it to uppercase. So we use a method reference. We're going to convert all those strings to uppercase, and then we collect them 
using a collectors.2 list, which is a utility method to return the appropriate collector to generate a list for us. So we end up with a list. So nice and simple, straightforward. We can extend that a bit and we can change it and we say rather than mapping everything to uppercase, what we'll do is we'll filter and only have the items which are even in length. So we change that to being a filter rather than a map. And then buffered reader is another class which we extended so you can now get a stream of lines of text from the buffered reader, which is quite nice. So we can say, okay, if we want to count the lines in a file, we simply do buffered reader dot lines dot count. And that's it. So we've got our source, we've got our terminal operation, no intermediate operations, and we've counted the lines in the file. And we can extend that. We can say, okay, take the lines in the file, but this time what I want to do is I want to take only the third line and the fourth line and join them together. So now what I do is I say, okay, get a stream, which is the lines, that's my source, pass that to skip, which will skip past a certain number of elements in that stream and then produce a new stream from that point. So that skips the first two, so we start at the third element. Limit the output of that stream to another stream limited to only two elements. So we'll take the stream that's coming from skip, take the first two elements, pass that as the output stream and pass it to collect. Then there's another utility method, joining, which will allow us to join those things into a single string and generate that as a result. So that's where we start to see the power of this because that's very simple, obviously, we can do that. Similarly, we can say, okay, let's find the longest line in a file. So we've got our reader, got our lines as our source, and then what we do here is we map to int based on the length of the string. So we create a stream of lengths of those strings. And then we pass that to max, which will look for the biggest value in that stream. What we get from that is actually an optional, so we need to get the result out of the optional, and we do that, we can do get as int, and that will extract the result for, from us, for us. And so we get the longest line in the file using only uh, like four lines of code. And if we want to, we could then say, okay, let's collect all the words in a file into a list. So this is where we see the idea of flat map. So we get lines is a stream of the lines of text in the file. Flat map will use a Lambda expression to generate a set of streams based on each element in the input stream. So what we do is here is we create a stream of the line based on being split using some regular expression, separates up on spaces, whatever. So what we get is a stream of streams. Each line has a stream of words, but we don't want a stream of streams, we just want a stream of words. And so flat map will do that. We'll concatenate it, we can then filter out any zero length words and generate a list. And just the last one is if we wanted to then take that and we say, okay, got our words in a file, convert them all to lowercase, sort them alphabetically and put them in a list. So again, that's like six lines of code which I've actually spread over a number of lines. Think how much code that would require to do that in Java before Java SE 8. And that's where you really start to see the power of streams. So just to conclude, basically lam Lambda statements were something that we really needed in order to simplify how we can pass behavior as well as ve values. And that allows us to then extend the collections APIs to have a more functional style of programming. To do that, we needed extension methods because we needed the ability to um, add new methods to an existing interface. And then the whole idea of the streams API bulk operations on collections, simplified processing, the ability to do things in parallel, the ability to optimize things. That's what it's all about. So Java SE8 really is a big change in terms of this kind of thing. And that's me. I'm a bit over time, but I'm sure nobody minds. So what, what, what do we do now? So, oh. Yeah, so they grab a mic, and this is going to be a <coughs> two-minute demo of... All right. All right, there we go.
All right, so um, Simon was talking about all the cool stuff you could do with Lambdas and the new Stream API. And one of the other big features in Java 8 is the ability to run all this stuff, including Lambdas and Streams, on small devices like the Raspberry Pi. So, oh, so a little bit about myself. My name's Steven Chin. I'm doing a crazy motorcycle tour through Europe for the next six weeks. Already been on the road for two weeks. And um, yeah, you can follow the broadcast and we're all streaming live. Um, okay, so we have a Raspberry Pi. I need a volunteer. You look like a good volunteer. What's your name? <laughs> Sven. Thank you. Um, and we have it hooked up to my computer here, so you can't see my screen. I'm going to run a application which enables this force sensor. And can you grab that? Not to, don't try to pull it out, but just see. Ah, okay. So what we have here is he's grabbing a force sensor. It's an analog force sensor. It's hooked up to a little analog to digital converter. And then um, it's connected to the Raspberry Pi using GPIO and a library called Pi4J. Thank you. The other thing we have on the board here, come on, you can stop, is we also have an LCD screen. So I'm going to get your help again. Um, so you can see there's a little LCD screen. And it prints out the force and the photo sensor. So if you grab the, this again, you should see the force number going up, yeah? And then if you cover the light sensor with your finger, this one? yeah, you see the second value going down, right? Yes. Okay. So just a quick example of what you can do with um, you know, Java 8 running on embedded devices like the Raspberry Pi. I'll leave this up here if you want to play around with it. And then I think we're on break, right, Michael? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, break time. <laughs>